Well, way back in 1939, some years would mind the Paddy wouldn't remember it down there any of the Second World War started. And we were issued with gas masks and ration books, and Hitler was playing particular hell across Europe at the time. We were rationed with two, pound, two ounces of bacon, two ounces of butter, and two ounces of lard. That is to do you the whole week. And old Maggie Moan come in to be mother, and she says, Alice, she says, I don't care, she says, what anyone says, but man, woman, or child needs at least one good feed in the week to keep the bowels in good work and all. <laughs> and Maggie was a woman that practised what she preached. <laughs> Not like, not like some of the ones we have now. At the <laughs> Maggie would go for her pension every Friday, get the pension, and then she would go in. You called it the rations that time. She got the rations and came home. Saturday morning, slung the pan, put on a lump of the lard on it, the two ounces of bacon, two duck eggs, and fried them. And then she lifted them off and she had a pan of lovely clear gravy and she would split the farl of bread down the middle and put the cut side down on the gravy and it soaked it up and when it was golden brown she took it off and ate it and lived to be 97 years <laughs> <of age. laughs> And that the war was the best thing that ever happened round our place because we had never any pocket money. I'd be out after rabbits and if you caught a rabbit it was one and sixpence. And you always had pocket money and I was out this day on the mountain and there was a man lived, he had a wee house up on the mountain called Dan Grant. No road up to it. The donkey had a path up, would carry up anything he wanted. And my mother would say, now when you were out, call in with Dan, because he might need something. But uh, I hadn't time, you were after rabbits on. But this day, that was like, some of the days like Friday there, sleet showers and snow showers come on. And I saw the shower coming, and I ran for the door. And as I was opening the door, the half door, the, the hailstones was happening at my heels. And I come in, and Dan was at the fire, and I says, Hello, Dan, I says, that's a bad day. No gassing, says he, there's no such a thing as a bad day. I says, do you see them hailstones? I do, he says, but that doesn't make it a bad day. Yesterday, he says, is past and gone, no good to you or me or nobody else. Tomorrow we might never see it. This is the best day in your life, he says. The two of us is alive. Come up to the fire. He says, I'm tra house training the young cat, he says, the day. He says he committed a misdemeanor over at the leg of the table there last week. And I'm watching him, he says, and I'll get him the day he won't want to go out that wet day. And as I went up to the fire, the poor cat put a hump on himself at the table. And Dan had the chair with no back on it and the stick across the chair. And he just lifted the stick like that and he fired it. Took the poor cat along the ribs and he made for the half door and as he was lighting on the half door, he let it shout and it clapped like that. And he says to me, he's house train. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> there was two grey goats laying, sitting, just laying beside him on the chair, chewing their cud. And the, the mother of the cat that he put out was laying on the hard stone. And the big dog, lovely big collie dog, was there just looking up into his face. And the tail going just like that all the time. That was all the part of Dan's floor was clean. <laughs> and, <coughs> he had the table there beside him, and he never had to get up from the fire. Everything he needed was there on that table. And... Uh, he had a, a brown jug at one time. It was a sort of a pot-bellied wee jug. And one day he came up into the bedroom and all he could see was the tail and the two hind legs of the young cat down in the jug of milk. And he'd done the wrong thing, he shouted. And as soon as he did, the cat jumped with the jug on his head and hit the heart stone. And Maggie Moan said to me, Mother, and the jug, Alice, she says, went into a hundred halves. <laughs> <laughs> he never replaced it. After that, if he wanted milk on his porridge or milk on the tea, he just called whatever goat was in milk to come over and done his couple of sticks. <laughs> and like that. Very clean man. <laughs> when he was finished with his dinner, 
either the, the plate and he'd scrape whatever was left on it to the dog on the cat and then he'd take the kettle and put a spout of water over the plate, turn it upside down on the table, do the same at the mug, turn it upside down, perfectly clean till the next time he came back. But the wee cor- three-cornered bit on the table, when he'd be taking his tea there, he'd split the farrel down the middle and he'd always then butter it on the inside there and he liked his butter and he'd have that there but sometimes when he'd be eating there as happened many of us the bread fell off the table now and again and if it fell on the side there was no butter on that nice shiny part of the bread all he had to do was just rub it in the leg of his trousers and leave it on the table <laughs> but if it fell with the butter side down with goat's hairs and cat's hairs and dog's hairs You'd think it was the animal that was going to walk up the table. <laughs> but at the time, he liked butter, and he'd have about a half an inch of butter on the bread, and he'd just lift the knife and take it up like that and close one eye and just go down like that <laughs> and throw it there. It was perfect. But the war came, butter rationed. All he could do was put a wee scrape of butter on it. And when it fell, it lifted as much as the other. And he couldn't go down, a dead loss. The dog had to get the bread and the butter, the whole lot, and bread rationed and butter rationed. But now and again, it, as I say, it would drop on the other side. And he began to think, why did the bread always, nearly always, t- nine times out of ten, fall with the butter side down? <laughs> why didn't it always fall the other side down and there'd be no problem? Well, he put in a fortnight trying to work out why did the bread fall with the butter side down. And he nearly had it a couple of times, and to finish up, he says, oh, it has me bait. I'll go over to my cousin, Mickey O'Head, he says, over, he lives over at the border. And he says, he's a smarter man than me, and when the two of us get together, I bet you we'll come up with answer. And he heads for Mickey. And the half door was open, and as he was going up to the door, he read his throat and shouted, Hello, Mickey, are you in? And when Mickey heard Dan's voice, he jumped. And he was coming to the door, but he was coming shuffling. Oh, my God, says Dan, what, have you pains or have you chillblains or what's wrong? <laughs> no, says he, I had the awfulest accident, he says, a man could have. He says, Come up and sit down, he says, till I tell you about it. Since this war started, he says, I crossed the border, he says, every week on the bicycle for to get tobacco. The tobacco you get down here, you couldn't smoke it, he said. I get Mick McQuaid and Dundalk every, every Saturday, and that does me the whole week. And once you fill your pipe off it, the customs men nor the policemen can't take it off you. And this day I was in Dundalk, <coughs> and says, I, I went to the butcher, so it's not, beef's not rationed up there. I'll go in and get a lump of steak or something. And then he, I went, he says, and there was the butcher, and he was working away with a pile of pink stuff on this big bench. And I says, what's that? He says, see, that's a new thing, he says, that's out now called sausages. <laughs> and I says, can you eat them? <laughs> oh, says he, they're great for eating, he says. And for a man with not many teeth, he says, there's no bones in them around, he says, they're great, he says. <laughs> says, I, uh, what way do you sell them? Well, he says, I sell them be the pound usually, but me skills is broken. He says, and what I'm doing, I'm making every sausage six inches long, and I'm selling them be the yard. There's six in the yard. <laughs> and we got, I says, I couldn't take a yard of sausages like so they'd be sticking out of me pocket for the bus custom men. He says, you leave it to me. I know all about smuggling. Take off your coat. I took off the coat and he says, take off that scarf you have round your neck. I had the scarf hanging round my neck. I took them off and he just comes over, hangs the yard of sausages round my neck. Now, says he, put on your scarf on the coat. And I did. I'm smuggling them this last six months and I'm meeting customs men and policemen and they don't know I'm smuggling at all. And this day I got up, it was raining cats and dogs. I says, I'll not get out the day. And then I says to myself, so I couldn't do a whole week without tobacco. And then I thought, I'll get on the bicycle and just go over a couple of yards to the road, go on the bus, wouldn't get wet at all. 
got on the bus and landed in, went down and got me tobacco, and I went down then to buy the sausages. Says I, I could take two yards of sausages rightly round me neck, just as handy as one, and I could eat two sausages a day, it wouldn't do me a bit of harm. In I goes, <coughs> and says I, I want two yards of sausages a day. Says he, did you see the sign in the window? I says, no. Well, he says they made a big consignment of them and with the wet day, there's not so many people out and they won't keep. I'm giving me customers a treat. One yard of sausages and you get two. You're buying two yards of sausages, you'll get four. <laughs> I says, well, how long now? How long? I says, I'm on the bus today. And the bus stops at the customs post and the man comes in. What would I do with four yards of sausages? To see, you leave it to me. Take off your coat. <laughs> and to get, I, I knew to take off the scarf myself. And was there. there was no one in the shop on either two of us. He says, pull your short off you when you're at it there. Well, I got the short off brave and quick for free air and anyone would come in. And he hands me the end of the sausages. Put them up against your belly. And I put them up. Now does he turn round. <laughs> well, I turned round and round and round. And he took the last one up in it. Now says he put your clothes on you. And as I was putting the clothes on, he was saying, Now, a wee bit of advice. When you're coming down to the customs post where the bus will stop, take out your pipe and tobacco. Start to fill the pipe. For there's nothing lowers the blood pressure with filling a pipe. <laughs> and just as the boy's about to come into the bus, you strike your match and put up your smoke. And he said, There's a man with an easy conscience, he's not smuggling, he'll go on the <laughs> Over I goes to the bus, the old utility bus with the door at the back. And I got in and I went way up to the nearly the front seat and sat down. And I looked, there was two big women sitting. Across from me, from Belfast, they were up smuggling blankets. And they were sitting over, and in a while, the bus filled up, and the whisper was round the bus, the customs man, he's after getting in, he's sitting at the back of the bus. Well, I got out the pipe and the tobacco to keep me face from getting red and to keep the blood pressure down. And as I was filling the pipe, I was looking, the two big women from Belfast was looking at me. And I wondered, Dan, what they were looking for at me for, but like yourself, I never was a ladies' man. Never, <laughs> never much heat on me. I, maybe they're not looking at me at all when I get the smoke up. I says, I look through the smoke. And when I got the smoke up, I looked through it, they weren't looking at me. But they weren't just looking at me face. And I looked down, I mustn't have closed me trousers. There was a bond of big sausages. <laughs> Well, sticking out in my throat. Well, I happen to have the knife there beside me, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> and as quick as late, then I just. <laughs> and I slipped it into me pocket with the knife as heavy as you see. And the big woman fainted out of my mouth. Well, they were round her and they were clapping her <laughs> and eventually they got her up and at that didn't the bus stop at the customs and the boy went in and took out a cup of water for the woman and she come round and they got her in the seat. He went out and he never looked at anybody. <laughs> well, I tell you, Dan, my face was red. <laughs> but I was smoking on it for to keep myself calm and as the bus then took to went on again, I looked again. My God, there was another out there. <laughs> I still had the knife in my hand. And I whipped it half again. My God, this time I, I fainted. <laughs> Me story, he says. God, I've put in an awful lot of weeks of it, he says. They're going to do something for me soon. I don't know what it'll be. Well, I says, tell him, 
I thought I had a problem come on over to you. But when I hear your problem, I have no problem at all. Well, I'll tell you, tell me anyhow, because things like that takes me mind away at things. Well, Dan started to tell him about the bread and the butter and the bread falling, and nine times out of ten it would fall on the butter side down. But now and again it would fall on the other. Why didn't it always fall on the other side? By God, Dan, to see, that's a tough one. <laughs> I'll tell you, he says, what we'll do. I'll go down, he says, and lean over the half door here, he says, and smoke. I get a bit of ease when I'm leaning over the half door. He says. And the pot of spuds is on there, he says, and I have sausages on the pan, he says, you can have a feed. <laughs> and tell me what you think of them. <laughs> and Dan got the dinner, and he was sitting down eating it, and the other man was smoking at the door, and in a wee while, he says, Hey, God, Dan says, see, I have it. I don't believe you. And what is it? You're buttering the bread on the wrong side. 